you know, a dollar bill is a, a worthless piece of paper with worthless ink printed on it, and yet people assign it value. This is Roger Veer. This is Zemo, the PCH Wolf. This is John McAfee. This is Vin Armani of Cointext. And you are listening to Humans of Bitcoin Podcast. Part of the Bitcoin.com Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the finale of Season 4 of Humans of Bitcoin. This is your host, Matt Tarrant. And today we have the founder of BitPay on the show. BitPay is a service for merchants and users alike. It allows merchants to accept Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash as an e-commerce solution online. You know, we talked to Joe Einhorn of Fancy.com. They're one of the many merchants that accept, thousands of merchants, I should say, that accept Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash using BitPay to have a, a seamless integration there. And they can decide what percentage they want to keep in crypto and what they want converted into cash. They also have a BitPay debit card that works anywhere Visa is accepted. And what I love about this episode is Stephen's story is unique to many that have been on the show because of his experience. He was around for the birth of the internet. And you'll see some comparisons between the early days of crypto and the early days of the internet and just his understanding of the past of the development of the internet and his goals of seeing a cryptocurrency come to fruition as he was patient. And when Bitcoin arrived, he jumped on it. And BitPay is one of the leading companies and most important companies in the space today. I can't stress how much I enjoyed this conversation and how much I learned. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. We are very pleased to have Stephen Pear on the show. Stephen, thanks so much for coming on Humans of Bitcoin. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. And so, Stephen, I want to start with the early days. I mean, tell us about your life, your career in the 1990s. Well, actually, my life started <laughs> well before the 1990s. But, you know, by the 1990s, I was, uh, you know, in the early 1990s, I was just finishing up with my uh, CS degree at Georgia Tech. And, you know, I, I was a big fan of DigiCash back in the day. And really, David Chalm and what they're doing at DigiCash is what got me thinking about this entire area. Listeners, really quick, what was DigiCash? A precursor to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, DigiCash was an electronic money corporation founded by David Chom in 1989. It allowed for online transactions that were anonymous. The anonymity was the biggest innovation there using cryptography. Nine years later, in 1988, they declared bankruptcy. Okay, back to the show. Well, let's take a step back. You know, tell me the context. Like, how did you discover DigiCash? Well, as a computer scientist, I was, and even before going to Georgia Tech, you know, I started writing code at a, at a ver very early age on a TRS-80 Model 1 back in the 1970s. And, you know, was just as a computer scientist, I was very, you know, and as a kid, I just loved cryptography. And I just loved the idea that you could, you know, take some text and, and uh, scramble it, send it to somebody and they could decode it, you know. It was just fascinating to me. But in the 1990s, Phil Zimmerman was trying to make cryptography available to everyone to use on the Internet. And he was going through a, a big drama around exporting what they considered to be military grade uh, cryptography technology. And so I was following that. And then also there were people talking about using cryptography to create uh, better payments on the internet or better platforms for payments. And, you know, that also fascinated me. I was very interested in just the concept of taking money. And, you know, in the 1990s, we were using physical money much more than we do uh, even today. And, you know, just the, got very fascinated about the idea of, uh, and I think I heard it expressed once that, you know, a dollar bill is a, a worthless piece of paper with worthless ink printed on it. And yet people assign it value. And, you know, why is that? And, you know, if you think about that a little bit, then what that tells you is that really this whole thing is an information system or money is an information system. And, you know, the logical leap from there is that if it is an information system, we should be able to do it entirely within a computer system and not need the physical money. And so that just, I got very fascinated with, well, you know, with, with, with how do you do that? And how do you do that in a, in a way that 
doesn't require like you know a central bank to issue the money or you know everybody to trust this one entity and you know Digicash came out they were really the first cryptographic payment system uh, seemed like they they might actually get somewhere with it and got a bank even signed up but you know ultimately Digicash went bankrupt and when they went bankrupt that payment system went away with it and so I think that got a lot of computer scientists thinking about well you know, how do you create a true internet protocol for payments that doesn't require somebody to, you know, everybody to trust one company to run it. And, you know, there's through the late 90s and early 2000s, it, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of progress being made. And, you know, and I, and I do think a lot of computer scientists thought it was an, an impossible thing to do, uh, that you're always going to require this centralized administrator of the payment system. But then Bitcoin showed up and timing wise for me, it was it was great because, I was looking to get back up into a startup environment. I was at IBM at the time. And, you know, I had some I other ideas, and but nothing just kind of grabbed me like Bitcoin did. For sure. And Stephen, before we get into Bitcoin, I want to go back mm -hmm. to DigiCash in the 90s. A couple questions for you. I think you have a perspective that can be both interesting and beneficial to those listening. First off, I'd like you to compare and contrast. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you saw this in, in 2014, even today in 2018, Stephen. A lot of people have to explain the imperfect comparison. This is like the internet in 1994 or 1996 in terms of how underdeveloped the ecosystem is. And obviously BitPay is working to develop that. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder sure. any signs you see, uh, you know, what's similar, what's different. I would think the skepticism is probably the same as it was for the internet. I'm sure you talking about the internet in the early 90s, people are like, what, what is this guy talking about? Oh, oh, totally. I can remember as clear as day, my first job out of college. So you're talking like 1994-ish. Yeah, I remember working on a project and like the head of sales at this company, and I was doing a project for the sales organization there, uh, came to me and he said, uh, and, you know, keep in mind, I'm right out of college, you know, young guy. And he, he walked up to me and said, are you one of those surfer guys, one of those web surfers. <laughs> and it was the funny thing. But, you know, uh, it was in those days in like 94, you know, if you were on the internet and the web, you know, a lot of people assumed that you were up to no good. <laughs> I didn't know that, that they thought it was for illicit activity, just like they say about Bitcoin today. That's funny. Oh, absolutely. Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. You know, so that's, that's one kind of similarity. Another similarity I can remember is when I first went to Georgia Tech, you know, I got my first inter real internet email address. You know, prior to that, I was on BBSs and dial-up modems and things like that. But I got my first real email address. And, and I, I was so excited. You know, I was like, this is the future. You know, I'm, I'm staring at the future. Email is going to be the future of everything. Everybody's going to communicate this this way. And, and yet, I had nobody that I could email. <laughs> I couldn't send an email to anybody because none of my friends were on, on email yet. But I couldn't stop talking about it because, you know, I just I could see the future and you know, I could see that this is really going to take off and everybody would be communicating over email because why wouldn't they? You know, it's so much more efficient, quick, fast and convenient than, you know, sending you know, snail mail around, uh, which is what they called regular mail back then. But, yeah, I tell all my friends and they were just like, yeah, whatever, you know, um, give me a break. Nobody's going to do that. And I, I got to dig more into this because you're one of the few people that's been on the show that can talk about this with some authority and experience, man. Yeah. So when they called you a surfer, right? Like, are you a Bitcoiner? But in this case, are you a surfer? Yeah. You know, what did they think you were doing that was so bad? Well, I, you know, a lot of what was going on with the, with the early days of the internet was, you know, you had, you had pioneers and you had, you know, people that were doing not so good things on the internet, you know, and, you know, engaged in different kinds of dark markets, underground activity and things like that. So I guess that's what they assumed that, uh, and I'm not saying they assumed that about me, but certainly it had that kind of seedy uh, reputation that cryptocurrency and Bitcoin has today. That is so fascinating. So the same, it seems like it was similar on the, you know, whatever this, oh, that now did it's like the magical internet money before it was just the magical internet. It's going to change everything, blah, blah, blah. I love that expression, by the way, magic internet money. I've used that in, in presentations before in that graphic that came out a number of years ago, because it, it reminds me of the uh, Arthur C. Clarke quote that says that, you know, any, I think it goes something like any sufficiently advanced technology looks like magic to people uh, or something like that, is, or is indistinguishable from magic. And that, that's kind of what Bitcoin is, right? A lot of people don't understand it. And so it just looks like voodoo stuff to them. And that's a great quote on the magic part. I never thought about that because let's just say you and I, uh, we're hanging out at Atlanta at a restaurant and we bring in from like a time machine, someone from 1908. 
and we show them our phones and like, what are you guys doing? Yeah. So magic is actually quite accurate. So they see the magic yeah. because it's magic. They don't understand it. And they kind of underestimate it. That's something that should be see at a, a movie theater, not in real life. That's right. Wow. Very fascinating. Now, any differences from, we'll say the, the pre or the early, the, we call it the stone age of the internet to the, the stone age of crypto? Well, I think in the, in the early days of the internet, there, it was a much smaller community, I guess, of, of both users and pioneers in that, that space. And, you know, you're talking about in days where a lot of people didn't have an internet connect. Most people did not have an internet connection at home. You had to go into a university or into, into an office to actually get on the internet. And so you didn't have, there's still skepticism that any of this was going to amount to much. And uh, whereas today, you know, everybody's on the internet, you know, you have social media and we didn't have any of that back in the day. So that changes sort of the, I guess, the social dynamics around the stuff today than as compared with the early days of the internet. There were crazy things. I remember somebody in a class at Georgia Tech saying that everybody's going to build applications in the future on this new Mosaic web browser. And I was like, you're nuts. I mean, it's just a, a tool that presents a document. How are they going to build applications on this? And yet, you know, here we are today, and, and pretty much all applications are built using web browsers and internet technology, and that's how we, you know, deliver those applications to users. And, you know, it's, it's interesting to look back on those days and think about, episodes like that or observations that somebody made and, and how it actually came about and happened. So, you know, you, you see similar things said today about, you know, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies or blockchains and somebody will say something and, uh, they, you know, they might be crazy, but they might also be seeing the future as it plays out in 10 or 20 years. I guess you could be fair. You can make a lot of large predictions and some might be true yeah. for all of them to be true or know exactly how it's going to play out. That seems to me, Stephen, as the kind of the fallacy there or the incorrect logic in that thinking that you can know exactly how it's going to play out when it's so early. That's right. Okay. So, you know, DigiCash, you worked at IBM, you saw the internet. I mean, it took a while. That was the early nineties. It was really like another 10 years before the internet really started kicking. I would say in the you know, early two thousands after the kind of internet bust or the, the internet stock crash. And so you were looking for something and looking to get back to a startup. So take us from, yeah. when did you first hear about Bitcoin? Well, I, I first heard it shortly after it came out. I think there was a slash dot, dot article I read. Because remember, I was in the late 90s, early 2000s. I was kind of keeping my eye out for projects and things that were making progress. For a little while, I looked at Second Life and Linden Dollars. And, you know, that was just a central ledger system. It, there was nothing exciting technologically about that. And so I was kind of on the lookout for different projects and just searching. And anytime I would see something, I would go read a little bit about it. And then, uh, you know, I was a, a fan of Ripple before the Ripple that we know today, there was something, a project called Ripple. And uh, the idea there was, you know, people would kind of keep track of how much they owed other people. And you'd figure out sort of a routing through a network of these debts that people owed and you, you could kind of balance them out and settle them out. And I actually tried to write an implementation of Ripple that was, um, at that time, they had the idea, but it, it ran on this like one centralized server. It wasn't like a peer-to-peer -peer network or anything. And, and so I, I thought maybe, maybe this might work, but it certainly couldn't, the world couldn't run it all in one server. So I uh, played around with that a little bit. And then I, I did read a Slashdot article like shortly after Bitcoin was launched and kind of the headline was run an algorithm on your computer and generate money. And I, <laughs> my first reaction was, there's no way that can work. That's, that's dumb, you know. But I got around to reading the Satoshi white paper in late 2010 and around the Christmas break there. And then, you know, reading the computer science white paper behind it, I understood what mining was all about and, you know, where what role it played in the system. And, and then I got very excited about it and started mining and all that kind of stuff. Wow. Amazing. And at least from our interaction today, Stephen, it, it seems like you're quite patient in the sense that, you know, DigiCash didn't work out. And then, you know, over 25 years later, something comes along and this is always in, in the back of your mind. And I know like Timothy May, the crypto anarchist manifesto that came out in like 1988, you know, 30 years ago from today. So you were kind of like skeptical, but hopeful, maybe at the same time, like, you know, yeah. this could happen, uh, but you were just waiting for the right one. And so something clicked when you read the white paper, you're like, okay, and you figured out how mining works. You're like, this is happening. And so what moves, did you make any immediate moves? Like, Hey, I'm, did you like quit IBM the next day or how did that work out? No, 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 no. 
No, I started mining, you know, went out and bought all the graphics cards around town and, you know, set up some rigs in my basement and uh, tried to keep it, you know, somewhat under the radar with my wife. You know, I, I kind of felt like she might think I was losing my mind. And, <laughs> you, know. <laughs> uh, you know, those are fun days, by the way. You know, I never quite had... There was nothing quite like, you know, when you had to take the server out of the rack for maintenance, something, you know, graphics card burned up and, you know, you're like, you know, very intently trying to get this machine working again because, you know, you wanted to get it back in, into the rack and earning those Bitcoins again. But those were fun days. And also the crypto manifesto written so long ago, you know, a lot of, you know, younger people don't tend to know a lot about that, you know, a lot of that kind of history, um, unless they go sort of out of their way to make sure they, they study it. There's a lot of, both on the computer science side and, and just in the pop culture, there's a lot of history, a lot of interesting things to go back and research and read. And there's a lot of old consensus algorithms that were invented in the 1970s that are more related to database that are sort of being reinvented now in the, in the context of, you know, blockchains. But there's a lot of research there that's been done for for a long time. And then pop culture, I like to try and get everybody here, all the developers here at BitPay, you know, reading, you know, Neil Stevenson and Snow Crash and some of those classics where, you know, it's fun to turn them on to that stuff when, you know, a lot of them have never heard of it, which kind of blows my mind because in my day that was, that was sort of those, those kind of thing, novels were, you know, all the rage and kind of predicted a lot of the stuff we see today. That's so interesting because I know there's Snow Crash and then and Roger talks about Cryptonomicon, which I yeah. admit I have in my Kindle. I haven't started yet, mm -hmm. but fascinating. And so you talk about like pop culture and young kids. I think a lot of people listening to this may be in the, the younger demographic. You know, what would you tell people right now that are into crypto? Like, what do they need to know? What are a couple lessons from history that they should know as we go forward in this very early stages of cryptocurrency, which is a very large revolution in its own right? Well, I, I think the main thing is it takes time. You know, big changes take time and you have to be patient and, you know, keep working at it and accept the fact that you're in a, in a sort of long-term transformation. It's not just things don't just happen overnight. They don't happen automatically. You have to make them happen. You know, and there's um, Alan Kay, who's, a, you know, did a lot to invent the early computing. He had this expression back in the 1970s, you know. Uh, if you want to predict the future, the or the best way to predict the future is to invent it. You know that that's sort of the approach I would I would encourage people to take. I feel like you started mining on the DL, so the wife didn't think you were going mad, and then the BitPay came. I mean, you started BitPay, I believe, in 2011. That's right. Okay, so that I means wow, seven years ago. Yeah, you've been in this for seven years. That's amazing. Yeah, we uh, launched the first version of BitPay right after the Fourth of July holiday. You know, we we had it ready to go before the holiday, and Tony and I, you know decided to take a uh, enjoy the 4th of July before we uh, actually turned the site live. But, you know, I had played around with a couple, you know, I was doing the mining. I had this idea maybe I would start a business where people could send me Bitcoin, then I would buy something for them and ship it to them. And after a few trips to the post office, I realized that that business wasn't going to scale. A lot of people, for in, interestingly enough, in the time, a lot of people wanted to buy the Barnes & Noble, uh, what was it, the Nook? <laughs> because I guess it wasn't available outside the U.S. You know, you couldn't buy it directly outside the U.S. So have people sending me Bitcoins. And I was playing around with signing uh, receipts and contracts, you know, acknowledgments of payment and things like that with uh, GPG. So that was one idea, but that quickly, I quickly realized that that wasn't going to go anywhere. And then, uh, you know, I, I turned Tony on to, on to Bitcoin and, you know, he and I had kept in touch over the years uh, on Facebook. And so I started talking to him about it and he had a similar reaction that I did early on. He was kind of skeptical. I, I think he, he told me to sell all my Bitcoins before the government shuts it down. <laughs> and fortunately I didn't do that. And then Tony came around and warmed up to it. And then he sent me a long email about the idea for BitPay. Um, at the time, there were already exchanges, so, and we felt like exchanges would be rapidly commoditized, and, uh, and we really wanted to build tools that made it easy for people to actually use the technology for what it was designed for. So that was the genesis of BitPay. For payments, yeah, and you look very good for your age, and I mean that with all due respect, but I mean, you're a very senior team at BitPay. Yeah, we've been at this for a while, and you know, you'll find a lot of other ex-BitPay employees out there that are starting their own companies or doing their own things out there, which I'm very proud of. Yeah, you should be. I mean, and you know, Ryan Charles with the money button, yeah. he's part of that, that alumni and he's done some, he's working on some really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. 
You mentioned like Bitcoin being used for what it should be used for, you know, as a currency. And uh -huh. you've talked about this before a little bit where, you know, a lot of, you know, centralized exchanges will say, hey, eventually there'll be decentralized exchanges. They'll take us out of business or someone like Coinbase and Binance are kind of working on decentralized exchanges because I see the future, even though that may be, I don't know how many years, years away. But one thing that I was curious about is your relationship with Visa, because Bitcoin is a payment network, right? And at its essence, you know, Bitcoin is, wants to replace Visa and MasterCard, yeah. but you have to work with Visa. How do you manage that relationship? Well, you know, any large company is, has an interest in staying up with the technology and not uh, falling behind or, or seeing where things are going. And while no entrepreneur starts a company and says, I want to build something great and then, uh, you know, sell it to a big company, the, the reality is that 80% of the time, that's exactly what happens. So, you know, the big companies pay attention, they invest, they partner, they want to learn. And, uh, you know, that's what Visa is doing and other payment companies. Gotcha. So they're, they're looking at this as well. And that's a really good point because there are like the idealist startup founder says that, hey, you know, I don't want to deal with like these big companies. We have this small startup, but then as they get bigger, they realize who are the clients that they most need are like the Fortune 500 companies sometimes. And I believe like Roger Veer was one of the first investors in BitPay. And that's when it was mm -hmm. just an idea in 2011. That's right. So Roger brought Barry Silverton to it. We were Barry's first investment. That investment rolled over into what's now known as the Digital Currency Group. So we're proud to say that we were the original investment by the Digital Currency Group. But yeah, Roger was um, very instrumental in those early days and in uh, kind of getting a lot of the investment going in the space, not just with BitPay. For sure. And for listeners that aren't aware of Barry Silbert, I mean, the Digital Currency Group, how would you describe that? I mean, they're gigantic. Yeah, I mean, it's great. Well, Barry was very exciting. It was very exciting for somebody like Barry to then get excited about BitPay and what was going on because, you know, Barry had started a company called Second Market. Second Market had uh, was very successful, uh, Facebook shares. So the idea for Second Market was that companies that weren't quite ready to go public and uh, were still private could have their shares trade electronically in, you know, for accredited investors on a platform. And so Facebook actually listed their shares there before they, they went public. And so that, that was a big deal for a company like Second Market. And you know, Barry had accomplished quite a bit with that company. And for him to then get interested in cryptocurrency and blockchains and, and so on and Bitcoin was very exciting for us. Very interesting. And yeah, the reason I mentioned that, it's like, I think that, you know, Barry, Eric Voorhees, Roger Veer, Charlie Shrem, just about any book or documentary about Bitcoin, they're going to be in it, you know? Oh, yeah, sure. And it'll be interesting history wise, you know, how that plays out. I feel like they're, they have a chance to go down in history books. So Eric has a long history of BitPay too. He designed our first logo. I don't know if many of your listeners know that, but the first logo for BitPay was designed by Eric Voorhees. I think we paid him like $50 worth of Bitcoin to do it. Oh man, that was an expensive logo. No, I think it was $65. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It ended up being quite the expensive logo. Yes. But uh, yeah, those were days we first met Eric in person when we went up to the first Bitcoin conference, which was in New York in 2011, August of 2011. Yeah. And listeners, we interviewed Eric and it was live two or three weeks ago. And he talked about that same conference in New York. So I'll send it to you, uh, Stephen, my interview with Eric. It was uh -huh. pretty insightful. Eric talked about the, the recent thing with the Wall Street Journal, but he talked about that first meetup. And I guess you were there. Roger was there. He said there's maybe one woman, one girl there that was his girlfriend, uh -huh. maybe 60 people, you know, but that was <laughs> like back then that was the Bitcoin conference. Yep. That was the first one. Gavin was there. Who else was there? Yeah. Uh, Charlie, I think, was just starting BitInstant at that time, or maybe he had a, hadn't even started BitInstant. Yeah. And there were quite a few companies there that aren't around today, of course. For sure. And so this is from an AMA on Bitcoin.com way back in 2015, all right, like a thousand days ago. Mm -hmm. And here's a quote. <laughs> so on terms of international adoption of Bitcoin, a uh, quote, US and Europe are neck and neck, but Europe is growing faster. South America is small by comparison, but growing fastest. Mm -hmm. Three years later, can you give us an update on that? Wow. I would say Asia is probably taking the lead. For BitPay, uh, we don't do a whole lot in Asia yet, although we're um, probably going to expand into that area in the not too distant future and try to, to uh, you know, take a more deliberate approach to that market. We see a lot of need for payments that you know, are coming from Asia to Europe or North America and vice versa. And just a lot of, a lot of pain points there for companies. But certainly since those days, I guess three years ago, Asia, 
just in general, not talking about BitPay specifically, but just in general, I think has uh, come on very strong and, and probably is the dominant region now for cryptocurrencies. Yeah, I do agree with that on Asia. And I feel that I think because of the language and cultural barrier, we see a lot more, you know, Western world news, but it may skew our understanding of the whole crypto space, because I think in terms of investment and development, you know, Asia's number one. So it's always good to have that in the back of your head. Yep. And Stephen, you know, we talked about this before the show, but, you know, you want Bitcoin to be used as a currency. You need people to spend it. But the other side of that is merchants that will accept it. And, you know, BitPay is a big player in that. And I just think of, you know, traveling around the world, I'll go to a town like, oh, they have this like one bar that accepts Bitcoin or, you know, it's kind of scattered right now. We're still very early. Mm -hmm. And sorry, I just want to say something to the listeners. It's one thing that I talked about at our Bitcoin.com team retreat. And I'm curious of your thoughts here, Stephen. I think a lot of times people think merchants and they think Expedia and Amazon.com. Not that it wouldn't be great for them to accept, accept Bitcoin. I know you've worked for some big merchants, but I also want to challenge people to just like we talked about understanding of adoption, I would challenge the idea of merchants. The majority of merchants is someone maybe with a taco truck in Mexico or selling just, well, I mean, it's a very, very small business with maybe one employees or just a family in terms of just the number of merchants. That's what merchants can be. So it could really be anything. I just think for merchant adoption, I think it would be a shame to only think about the large retailers when the majority of merchants in the world are, are just very, very small, mini micro businesses. Mm -hmm. But back to the question, how do you convince a merchant to start taking Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash? Well, you know, a lot of the companies that we sign up are coming inbound to us and they've heard about it and uh, they're learning about it and they're asking us, you know, how do I get started? And we don't actually have to sell them that much on it. We're not, we don't tend to focus our energies on a lot of outbound sales. We're more, you know, taking those, those people that have a curiosity and think they might want to do it or think they might need to be doing it and converting those inquiries into, into actual customers that sign up on the platform. And we talk about all the, you know, the benefits in terms of cost savings and the speed of payments and whatnot. And by the way, another a big misconception is that zero confirmations are not trustworthy and that uh, blockchain payments are slow. And actually, it's 180 degrees the opposite. You know, when if you want to compare a blockchain payment to a uh, traditional credit card payment. Both are instant. You know, they happen right away. You have the initial transaction that's created that's not confirmed yet, but you receive it. And we on our platform do things to sort of mitigate the risk of a double spend. Hey, Matt here one more time. So what is double spend and zero confirmation? So a double spend, and this has always been one of the biggest challenges of creating a successful cryptocurrency. If you could spend the same Bitcoin more than once, it would not be a reliable, workable currency. It would not hold value. And zero confirmations means a transaction showing up before it's been confirmed. And a confirmation just means someone running a node or a copy of the whole Bitcoin blockchain before it's confirmed on a node. So Stephen will talk more about that. Back to the show. On a credit card transaction, there's a whole lot of risk on that initial transaction as well. People don't know this, but about one in 250 credit card transactions are fraudulent. And international credit card transactions, the number is more like one in 50. So there's a lot of risk in that credit card transaction when it happens. And then it takes, you know, about 20 to 30 minutes to, you know, be uh, for things to, you know, finalize and be sort of permanent and confirmed in the into the blockchain. Whereas a credit card transaction, you're looking at three months for that transaction to become final. So if you want to compare the speed you're talking about for a, a final transaction, credit cards take about 90 days and a Bitcoin transaction will take you about 30 minutes to get a, a you know, good two or three confirmations. So blockchain payments are by far faster and more efficient and cheaper than any traditional electronic transaction. Very good point there. I'm impressed because, you know, a lot of the questions I got was from your AMA in 2015, which listeners, I'll link to it, podcast.bitcoin.com. I, I never want to hold anyone to comments or tweets they make because we're learning and changing our ideas all the time. But some of the things you're saying are exactly what you say today, which is pretty impressive. And that just speaks to your deep knowledge and perspective. Yep. I'd say that another thing that related to that in, in how to add merchants, you kind of talked about like, convincing people, if they're not really interested, don't try to sell them, just work with the people that are already interested. And I think that's a very powerful statement. And you just said that there with BitPay, if you're already interested in Bitcoin, come to us. We're not really going to try to do the hard sell to someone to start start taking Bitcoin cash and Bitcoin at their restaurant. 
And so I like that. I like, I do find that, you know, when people ask you, what do you do? And you say Bitcoin, they're like, what is Bitcoin? And they'll, they'll ask you questions and, and they're, you know, they can be justifiably skeptical, but I think there's a lot of energy wasted maybe in people that are just not going to be interested until it, there's no choice. Probably the same thing. I would guess the same type of thing happened with the internet. People, you know, were not interested until everyone was using the internet and they were kind of forced to, to use it. There's a large percentage that will start using Bitcoin that way, which is fine. Yeah, I don't think anybody was forced to use the internet, but they saw the value in using the internet, right? <laughs> sure. Forced, I realize, is a strong word, but I mean, they, the value became so obvious that you didn't have to sell it at all. Yeah, and that's what's going to happen with this stuff. Absolutely. And sorry, just when you say well, that's what's going to happen today in 2018, you feel your confidence level is very high that this is just an inevitable uh, cryptocurrencies? Yeah, and I would say blockchains as a database technology are, you know, are incredibly exciting as well because we see blockchain style databases becoming, you know, sort of replacing old legacy traditional sort of Oracle style databases where your security model is let's create this data set and let's protect it from intrusion. Let's create boundary defenses. And, you know, if you look at a Bitcoin database, the model is completely inverted. And so instead we say, let's open the whole database up to everybody. But we set these rules about what uh, constitutes a valid transaction and, and versus an invalid transaction. And I, I see practically every database, or at least every transactional database, moving to that model over time. So at BitPay, we want to transform our back office from being sort of this traditional API-centric service that we provide to instead being a blockchain-centric service so that our customers are not making API calls, but they're, they're actually creating transactions that go into the BitPay blockchain. And I think all companies will, will move to that over time, and you'll create a, a much more secure and, you know, internet that uh, is, is much less vulnerable than it is today. Okay. And this kind of relates to my next question for you. This is another statement I'm taking from the AMA. Quote, our objective is to find solutions where we don't take possession of any funds except those which are paid to us for our services. Mm -hmm. Elaborate a little bit more on that, the, the goal of the future there. Well, you know, we would like to make it so that we don't necessarily have to be providing the liquidity for all the payments that are on our platform. And instead, it could be, think of it like an open market. So if somebody has Dogecoin and they want to make a payment and the recipient wants to receive a U.S. dollar stablecoin, that BitPay can provide the platform where any liquidity provider could step in and say, you know, I can do that. I'll make that transaction happen. I'll take the Dogecoin and I'll deliver and settle a U.S. dollar stablecoin even between blockchains, you know, going from the Dogecoin blockchain to the Ethereum blockchain, for example. And so in that model, BitPay doesn't have to actually be the liquidity provider. We don't have to take possession of funds. We can charge a fee, um, or ideally we wouldn't charge a fee at all. It would be a blockchain itself that we simply have created and people use. Very cool. And yeah, man, a couple of things to finish up here. You, you know, it's like, a, I think your understanding of the history of technology and the internet, as well as the present, the future is unmatched of anyone I've had on the podcast. And I don't say that lightly. And another question for anyone listening, let's just say someone graduating college or they're maybe they're 35 and they, they don't know what to do with their lives, but they want to get involved. And they just say, I know this Bitcoin and blockchain is going to be big, but I don't know where to start. How would you guide them in terms of starting to learn and, and get involved with this? Well, that's a tough one because uh, there's so much material out there and there's a lot of experimentation going on, on and it's uh, tough to know where to start. Uh, you know, I, I started when I wanted to first learn about Bitcoin and how it worked by going and I actually refactored the entire client, the Bitcoin client, and <laughs> uh, told the developers at the time, you know, this is, uh, you know, a lot of the code at that, at that time in, in Bitcoin Core was, or Bitcoin QT as it was known back then, was actually up in header files. And so I, I went and I sort of cleaned all that up and put it into more of a normal structure that you would expect in a C++ project. And, and I said, hey, I haven't really changed any of the logic here. I've just cleaned everything up, made it easier for people to work on. And so let's use this. And uh, Jeff Garzik shot that down. He said, that's too much change. We're not doing that. But it was a very effective way for me to actually learn you know, in depth how the system worked and convince myself that it was actually a viable system. So if you're a computer scientist wanting to, to get into this coming out of college or whatever, you know, that's a good way to start. Just figure out a project and get started on it. You know, go figure out how to replace GitHub with a blockchain. You know, that would be a great one to start on. Yeah, there you go. Great idea there. One thing I wanted to ask you, because I actually, I've been like thinking about this idea and there was a conference that some friends of mine put on for kind of digital nomadic entrepreneurs. And a lot of them have e-commerce stores. 
But the one thing that they found a problem with, and I don't think BitPay has this right now, I could be wrong, is an easy recurring subscription payment model. Because with fiat currency and a credit card, let's just say I have a website where I have videos on how to, you know, for C++ programming, just as an example, and pay $10 a month, you get access to all the, the videos. Does BitPay have plans to do kind of like recurring payments that way using, I know it'd be a little bit difficult, but setting up recurrent payments or, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash? Yeah, there are right ways to do that. And then there are ways to do that that kind of are probably easier, but, you know, less perfect. Let's put it that way. This is something that's come up many times over the years. So a very simple way we could do that is to have a reminder basis, a simple way that doesn't require us to maintain funds on behalf of someone else. It might be to, to put a reminder in the wallet and to be and to allow bills to be delivered directly to that wallet. And you just click like one button to make the, the payment. You know, that's sort of a reminder based system. It's not a, you know, a lot of companies want to do, which is just pull the money out and, and the person making the payment doesn't even have to think about it, which is what they're used to with credit cards, right? You know, another way to do that is we, uh, without also coming up with a perfect solution is just to have an account. So you open an account with BitPay and then you give permission to certain merchants to draw money out of your account. Um, that's another sort of low tech way of doing it. The right way to do it is with the use of smart contracts and involving multiple parties. So if you think about how it works today with a, a credit card, you have a merchant that, uh, you know, they're selling some subscription service. Let's say it's a website subscription. You have the buyer and then you have this you know instrument like a credit card. And that credit card is a relationship between the consumer and, you know, a financial institution of some sort. And then... They give permission to that merchant to draw money out like once a month. So you have this sort of three-party contractual relationship that happens there. And if you can do that with smart contracts, that's, that's kind of the right way to do it. But it's also the most challenging. And there's really not a good platform out there today to, to create something like that. Uh, you know, Ethereum, you know, you can do some of that. You can get sort of most of the way there with Ethereum. But Ethereum has its own set of challenges. Gotcha. So maybe to sum that up is there's some workarounds right now that are imperfect, but it's going to take some time for it to be as seamless as, you know, our Netflix recurring subscription is today. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So two more things here. One is, this is really important to me as well. Another quote from you, Stephen. I will also mention that we've been bothered by the attitude that some have taken towards the mining community. BitPay's success depends largely on miners providing a well-functioning network. And in layman's terms, right, you know, for my mom to understand, mm -hmm. explain that. Well, you know, miners, they secure the database. So in the case of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, you know, they are providing this security function for the database or integrity function for the database. And the token on these blockchains creates the incentive mechanism for them to provide that service. So they are an important part of the ecosystem. I mean, if you were to launch a new blockchain, a brand new blockchain, and you wanted to incentivize, you wanted it to be secured, you, you need to actually pay miners to mine your blockchain and validate the transactions and put them in an order. And, and so from that perspective, they're an essential part of it. And it's really the same thing, whether you're talking about proof of work or proof of stake, you know, in, in the case of proof of stake, you're also transacting and you're, you're paying people to validate. They're just using a, a different mechanism to do it. So I, I just, at that time, it seemed like, I mean, the miners were just under attack. And, you know, we have, have to have, as a company building a, a payments platform, we have to have a good relationship with people that are securing the platforms that we're using for those payments. Yeah, makes complete sense. And uh, you mentioned proof of stake and listeners, you know, the mining with like the, the nonce and, and solving the computer problems is proof of work, proof of stake. I don't want to say like the Federal Reserve, but, you know, it's, you stake your tokens and get rewarded a, a percentage. I mean, what's your take overall on proof of stake? Oh, you know, it's... Um, I mentioned earlier those algorithms from the 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, when some of these first started appearing, I said, you've just reinvented Paxos. You've added some Byzantine fault tolerance to Paxos. And Paxos is a, you know, a consensus algorithm that was invented in the 1970s. And I don't think a lot of the people realized they were just reinventing what was done in the 1970s. And to be fair, they weren't just reinventing it. They were doing Paxos-style consensus with cryptography layered on top of it to achieve the sort of Byzantine fault tolerance. I think the biggest skepticism I have about proof of stake is that it requires you to ask somebody else for permission to be able to secure that, help secure that network. Whereas, 
in the case of proof of work, as long as you have a supply of energy and some chips, you can do it without anybody's permission. So I, I think that that right there is the fundamental skepticism I have. But having said that, you know, we shouldn't be closed minded about the potential of some better consensus mechanism forming that uh, may not require, you know, mining and proof of work. And I'm pretty excited. You know, Dave, I mentioned David Chowman. DigiCash, he's working on something called Elixir, which is a completely different model to how to, how to do payments and how to do consensus. And I'm interested to see what they come up with because there, there might be something there. It's probably the first project I'm really, really excited about, you know, beyond, you know, Bitcoin itself. Although Zcash was kind of, yeah, Zcash was kind of interesting though. That is so fascinating. And Zcash, just the two things I want to add. I mean, Zcash, you know, with like Timothy May's crypto anarchist manifesto, he talks about like, ZK snarks and stuff and like, whoa, Zcash, it came along. Yeah. You predicted it. Amazing. But David Chom, I mean, you know, I actually hadn't heard of DigiCash before this interview. Uh -huh. But to me, one thing that seemed to Leb talks a lot about is failed entrepreneurs as heroes. And let me make a distinction. I'm not saying that David Chom is a failure. I'm saying DigiCash was a failure. But by having these unsuccessful projects, they're actually doing a lot of great work. All the stress they go through and, and almost making it work, they paved the way for things like Bitcoins. So they're really adding a lot. And to me, that's really good to hear that he's still around years later working on an exciting new project. That's great, man. Oh, well, you know, I had the good fortune to talk to him for a good bit a couple of weeks ago and first time I'd ever met him. And I think he was very appreciative of what Bitcoin has done for the whole space because, you know, when DigiCash went bankrupt, uh, there was a, a period of time there where there was no interest by any, you know, investors or anything in putting money behind anything in this area. And it was just kind of dead for a long time. And, and Bitcoin has certainly resurrected interest in the whole space. So I think he definitely appreciates that. Yeah. You know, by the way, Zuko, who created Zcash, uh, used to work at DigiCash. So there's a lot of, a whole lot of connections back to DigiCash. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. I think I'm going to have to bring David on the show. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah. For sure. Well, Stephen, my time is running out with you. Unfortunately, this has been an amazing conversation. I do want to add that for me, you know, I'll go to a restaurant, a cafe, um, you know, meet up with friends and people say, what do you do? I said, well, I work for Bitcoin.com. Wait, you know, it's either what's Bitcoin? Like, oh, Bitcoin, that funny money, that, that magical internet money, as we talked about. But I'll have my BitPay card in a week. I sent it to someone in my family's house <laughs> and I'm going to bring it back to Europe. So I cannot wait till I'm at a cafe. And they're like, yeah, but you can't use Bitcoin anywhere. Pull out my BitPay card. It's like, no, actually, I'm going to pay the check right here. I, you know, I think any Bitcoin nerd <laughs> dreams of that moment. So I'm really excited to use my BitPay card pretty soon coming up here. Awesome. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much and keep up your amazing work with BitPay. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. This is Evan Luza, product designer at Bitcoin.com. You're listening to the Bitcoin.com podcast network. For all things Bitcoin wallet, mining, news, events, and more, head over to Bitcoin.com. You've heard the buzzword blockchain, but what impact will it really have on the world? Listen to the Blockchain 2025 podcast to find out more. In each episode, we take a hard look at one industry like gambling, art, international trade, or wine, and we debate how it could be impacted by blockchain. Subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Part of the Bitcoin.com podcast network.